You asked for it and I'm delivering like FedEx, baby. Welcome to my Substance Painter for Beginners tutorial in the video coming up. What's going on, you texturing titans? This is JL Musi, and today we are talking about Substance Painter and how a beginner could actually get started. When I first started 3D modeling, I really struggled with texturing, and that led to a unhealthy relationship with 3D modeling. So what do I mean by that? Well, I used to 3D model way too many details in hopes of avoiding texturing. And while that actually got me better or really good at modeling, I really suffered in the texturing part because I didn't really push myself. And for a while, I was just texturing in Photoshop and I was okay at it. And that was really the main uh, option for 3D artists looking to texture the models was Photoshop. Fast forward to today, we have a package like Substance Painter. And when I think about Substance Painter, I think about dramatic improvement in my texturing in a very short amount of time. So I picked up Substance Painter in a couple of days. I got the workflow, I got the hang of it. By no means did I master it, but I got good enough to just jump in there, throw in a model, texture it, and even render it within IRA and get really, really good results way better than I had in previous years or attempts just doing it the old school Maya to Photoshop. So in a nutshell, Substance Painter was a game changer for the amount of improvement that I made in a very short time to my finished 3D artworks. So without further ado, let's get on with the video. So let's get started with this Substance Painter introduction uh, for beginners. And for this tutorial, I'm not gonna cover the whole interface, meaning I'm only gonna show you the things that are most important and that I use on a daily basis within Substance Painter. I could go ahead and show you every single feature, but that'd probably be a three or four hour tutorial, right? So I wanna get you going from zero to 60 as fast as possible. So I'm gonna show you my workflows and the things that I deem most important when first learning Substance Painter. I'm gonna go to File, and I'll go to new. And here, uh, all these things can be changed on the fly, but I wanna go ahead and have a 2K document resolution. And then uh, we're gonna leave this at PBR uh, metallic roughness, that's fine. So I'll go to uh, file here and I'll go to select and you'll have two of these files and I'll show you exactly what they're for here, but this is actually gonna be a used to generate ID map. Uh, but for now, we're gonna start with the mech sphere and we're gonna hit open and we'll hit okay. All right, now we have our model loaded and the first thing that we should figure out how to do is actually navigate. So um, to navigate, and if you're coming from my, this should feel pretty similar. We're gonna hold alt and left click and we're gonna orbit. We're gonna hold down alt and middle mouse to pan, alt and right click to zoom in and out. And just like in Maya, if we're right here off in space and we hit the shortcut F, we're gonna frame on our object, okay? So let's go ahead and take a brief uh, quick look at the interface itself. Uh, right here, we have our tools, including our brush, our eraser, our polygon picker here. We have a lot of tools here. We're gonna cover that in a second, but just like Photoshop, it's docked right here on the left-hand side. And then towards the bottom, we have our shelf that allows us to pull in assets in and out uh, from Substance Painter. If we go to all here, we'll see pretty much all the um, assets or information that we could use within Substance Painter. And I'm gonna cover some of these, not every single one. So here's our alphas. Alphas can be used within brushes. Uh, I use them a lot to actually stamp in height information, and we're actually gonna do that in a little bit. Textures, these are pretty much uh, any textures that you bring in, that you create, or that you import. These are actually gonna be uh, propagated here. Then we have filters. Uh, filters are just basically effects, like in Photoshop, uh, that you could just use to manipulate and just add more effects or complexity 
to your uh, materials. Brushes, pretty self-explanatory, just like Photoshop. Uh, you have presets, and just like most packages, you could actually create your own import, save them out. Particles, uh, particles are actually just effects. They actually deal with particles and physics to give you paint strokes or effects based on real world simulation. I really don't use these too much, but they're definitely an option if you want to explore. Uh, sometimes certain effects can be hard to recreate with a brush, and that's when uh, these effects actually come in handy. Materials are just your basic materials, just like any other package. Smart materials are just materials with more effects, and these are usually the ones that you see with the edgeware, the grunge, and all those cool little uh, effects that Substance is known for. Uh, these smart materials, when set up properly, are the ones to drive those. Smart masks uh, kind of go along with smart materials, but these are the masks that drive uh, that can drive uh, some of the more complex effects within your materials. Environments. So environments, uh, if you look at this background here, right? And if we do shift and right click, uh, we're actually orbiting uh, or we're rotating this environment sphere. And these images are actually driving the lighting, right? So if we wanna go ahead and change this, we can just drag and click and you see that this is gonna be updated. And now if we orbit, uh, this uh, color or this image information is actually going to be affecting our materials as well. A side note on environments, you want to be careful, uh, especially when building uh, your materials within Substance, and especially if you're going to be creating or rendering in another package, or, or you're working in a team environment, you know, don't go with something so extreme because if you're building your material uh, solely based on this environment, you might overcompensate take it into a package like Maya, and then, you know, your, uh, you know, if you have neutral lighting compared to this, this is gonna look completely different. So, uh, I like to use this um, panorama here. This is pretty much the default one, but uh, from time to time, I do like to uh, basically compare it uh, with a studio setup, and the studio setup just introduces lighting, but has no color information, okay? That's pretty much the uh, shelf in a nutshell. Uh, at least the more important uh, features that I use uh, more often. Side note is it does have a filter feature here. So if we're in environments and we type in uh, panorama, right? We see a panorama pops up. But if we go to maybe uh, alphas and we type in panorama, right? It, it, it's not gonna come up. So just be uh, weary of whatever you click here is gonna add a filter. But if you're in that subfolder uh, and you know you're not paying attention, you might not find what you need. So just when in doubt, clear the filter if you know something by name, or just know uh, what uh, folder it inhabits before actually trying to do the filter search. So let's go ahead and take a look at the right hand side of the screen. This right here is going to reflect whatever you name your uh, shading group within Maya. So not your actual material but your shading group within Maya, or really whatever package you're importing from, okay? Now, if we had multiple uh, materials applied to this object, they would actually show up right here, but right now we're just working, since it's a simpler object, we're only working with one material. Right here, we have layers, we have no information, so let's go ahead and add some information, right? So, we have two main types of layers. We have a regular layer, and we have a fill layer, right? So a fill layer, just the best, easiest way to think about it is just a solid color. And then a regular layer is just like a blank layer within Photoshop where you can paint with a brush and actually add information. So let's go ahead and add a fill. You'll see that this is solid, indicating that this is a fill. And here we have a lot of information. Now, the thing about substance is that we could actually work on all these um, different parameters at one time, or we could actually uh, work on separate ones, right? So whatever we had clicked on, that's what we're actually gonna work on, right? So for example, if we go here to our color, right? And we wanna change this, you see that now this is being filled and color is the only thing that's uh, being added uh, by this fill layer, right? So we don't have any height, we don't have any roughness, 
we don't have any metalness, we don't have any uh, normal information being. So we could actually check them on or check them off and you see that they're added here or taken away, right? Let's go ahead and just leave this to color. And then what I'll do here is I will add a regular layer, right? And for this one, I'm actually gonna paint some height information, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and get my brush from the left hand side. And you see, as I'm painting here, we have a couple things happening, right? We have this white stroke. So this white stroke is being controlled by this right here, right? So if we wanted to paint with a different color, right? We would just come in here. Now we see that our stroke color has changed. So what we could do, let's actually undo this one and we'll just paint with the red, right? So we'll just paint this X here. So now this layer is contributing um, all these channels right here. So let's go ahead and take uh, both of these and let's only work with color and height. So we have color information, but we don't have any height information. That's because the height is actually being driven by this slider, right? So if we go ahead and decrease this, it's not going to update our stroke. But if we undo this stroke, right, and then we go ahead and uh, put this height down. Now it's actually going to dig in, right? So now you see that we're actually painting with color and height information, okay? So let's go ahead and add some roughness, right? So what does roughness actually describe, right? Well, roughness is basically going to dictate how shiny or how rough is the actual surface. So as roughness goes up, the amount of shininess is gonna go down and vice versa. So if we go ahead and basically put this all the way down to zero, we start painting. And what I'm gonna do here, right, is paint with this stroke. And we see how shiny that is, right? Because this stroke right here has zero roughness, right? While this one had a little bit of roughness, this one has none, right? So as we paint, we see how shiny that is, right? So on the flip side, if we come here and we drive roughness all the way up, what do you think is gonna happen? So our new stroke, is gonna be very, very dull. So that's pretty much what roughness drives and that's how you can control if it's being applied or not uh, onto your layers, okay? Metalness uh, works a little bit similar, but it describes how metal a object actually is, okay? So let's go ahead and do this. I'm going to go ahead and delete this layer, right? And let's go ahead and add a new layer, okay? And now we're just going to work with a metalness by itself. So if we activate it all the way to one, you see that we're actually painting metallic information onto our material, right? And then if we go ahead and go all the way to zero, we're going back to a matte surface that is not metallic at all. Normal information uh, works uh, very similar to height information, so I'm not really going to dive into that, but um, it's just basically going to add normal information, and then height information could actually be converted into a normal map or a normal information as well, right? So uh, these actually work uh, very similar. So that's pretty much the, uh, the five main components that you can paint uh, all together at one time, or you could actually paint separately. So let's take a, a deeper look into layers. And I'm gonna go ahead and just delete this one so we can hit the delete button here. I'm gonna go ahead and add another layer here. And I'm gonna show you a little bit about the blending modes. They work exactly like Photoshop. So if you work with Photoshop, even a package like GIMP, these should actually be similar. So we're gonna go ahead and just work with color here. We're gonna go ahead and get a black color here and then we'll just go ahead and paint. So we'll go ahead and paint this here and then we can just change the opacity, right? Just like in Photoshop, we could go ahead and do that. We could uh, hide and unhide by clicking the eyeball. We could also change the effect. So we could, uh, you know, a lot of times artists use uh, the multiply, especially working with darker tones, works the same way. So we could set a layer to multiply and maybe we can go ahead and just uh, play with the opacity and dial that down. You could actually group uh, layers together as well. So we can select both of these. We can right click and we can go ahead and create a group. 
and now this is a group and we have layers within that group and this group will basically control the layers underneath. Let's go ahead and delete all these. One last thing about uh, layers here uh, before I delete this, let me undo the grouping here. I'm going to go ahead and delete this. Let's talk about masking just on a basic level. If we wanted to work in a non-destructive fashion, we could actually work with a mask, right? So I, I'm going to go ahead and right click here. I'm going to add a white mask. Okay. So white is going to reveal and then uh, black is going to hide uh, whatever uh, your uh, fill layer is or wh whatever your layer is, right? I'm going to go back to a white mask, right? So now I'm going to actually just tweak this mask itself, right? So I'm going to use a, a black brush here. And you see that with this, I'm actually just erasing, right? I'm taking away just by using this black mask, right? If we had an alpha, right? So maybe we wanted to stamp out uh, something from this. So what we could do is just add a little bit of complexity here. We can go to our materials. We can add a metal. So I'm going to search for metal. So we'll go to iron or raw damage, apply that. We see that this is being applied and this might look a little bit off. Keep in mind, we haven't baked our maps yet, but that's fine. So for now, what I'll do is I'm going to go ahead and drop this here towards the top and we have that mask. We could just go in here and obviously white's not going to help us since this is already filled. But if we go to our brush, and just change the color to black, right? You see that this is being changed. So now we can go ahead and erase and we're, we're going to reveal what's underneath, right? If we wanted to have something uh, more precise, what we could do instead of just, you know, manually doing this, well, maybe we could use one of those alphas that I talked about earlier, right? So how will we do this? Well, you see within the brush, we have this shape here, which we can click. And we can go ahead and just select any of these alpha. So now we're going to have a alpha here that we can just basically paint with, right? Since we need a little bit more control, let's talk about the actual uh, brush controls, right? So here you can control the brush just like in Photoshop. You can control the size. So you could do it within this uh, brush uh, slider here, right? The one thing about this is that we could actually control this on the fly. So if we hold on control and then with right click, we scrub left to right. You see that I'm changing the size on the fly, right? The other thing that we could actually change on the fly as well is if we control and left click and we move up and down, we see that we're controlling the angle on this, right? Or the rotation of this alpha or really just any brush. So control up and down is going to change the uh, angle on this, but control left and right is going to change the flow, right? If we bring this down, we're going to bring down the flow of this and we're going to get a more muted effect if it's on 15 versus if it's on a hundred. We can go in here and then we can go ahead and just start uh, basically carving in. Right now we're just working with color. So we could actually introduce height here. Height, since it is on a fill layer, right? And this is actually updating the mask. Um, you will actually see the changes update here. So we could actually go ahead and push down. And now we're not only working with the alpha here, but we're actually working with the height information. We can go back to our layer, okay? And w one note about fill layers. If you're ever on a fill layer, and this used to happen to me a lot, if you have that selected, it won't let you paint. So make sure that if you want to paint, you actually have to be on a mask or you could actually right click and add a paint layer to this, right? But if you're just on a fill layer, you won't be able to actually paint over. If it's not giving you the brush, you know, just don't try to fight it. Just make sure that you're actually painting on the right thing. So I could go back in here. I can maybe take this guy and then maybe flip this and maybe I can go ahead and scale this down a little bit. And now we're just adding more uh, texture information on there like that. Okay. So that's a little bit about the brushes. So now that we have uh, some color information here, let's actually look at the split view and that's going to enable us to actually dissect a couple more options. 
here by default to bring your UV layout or your, your texture set uh, view, right? Just that, that flat 2D image. You could actually go here. If you click this button here, right now we're on 3D only, but we can actually look at 3D slash 2D. Uh, you see the shortcut is F1 if, if you need to access that via the shortcut. But now we're actually taking a look at the, you know, the 2D image here, the actual texture set. So the cool thing about Substance is that, and this actually is, you know, depending on your UV layout, but we could actually paint here, but we could actually paint on the, the actual texture set itself. As we update or rotate this environment sphere, you see that this is actually going to be updated as well, right? So we could, you know, add it here and you see that it's uh, being updated here or we could just add it here and you see that it's gonna be added here. Like I said, sometimes it's gonna be easier to uh, paint on your model itself. Sometimes it's gonna be easier to paint on your texture set. And this is really just the cleaner your UV layout is, this is gonna be easier for you, right? Uh, using this option. Just really depends on what you're actually trying to paint. So now that we have these two views available, the brush is actually gonna behave a little bit different depending on what or how you actually tell it to behave. Meaning, if we go here to our brush settings, we see that we have a couple options if we uh, scroll down. So the alignment, okay, we can tell it to align to the camera. So however the, the camera's aligned, well, this, this um, brush is actually gonna be aligned, right? If we go here to the UV, well, this is gonna be aligned perfectly with the UVs, right? So maybe if you, if you wanna paint with your UVs and have more precision, you probably wanna have the alignment set to UV versus set to camera or tangent uh, wrap. Tangent wrap is gonna just wrap around the tangents. This is gonna basically use the camera to orient and uh, this is gonna be basically uh, aligned with your UVs, okay? So just keep that in mind. If you're not getting the right placement like you want it, or if you're clicking something and the scales are off, you know, you could definitely play with, play with this and get the one that you actually need. I'm gonna leave this at a uh, tangent wrap. So let's go ahead and explore the rest of the settings here on the right-hand side. Here we have our display settings and we have these icons here. These are basically tabs, so as we scroll down, these are actually gonna change. So here's your environment settings by default. Let's actually go ahead and go back to our 3D view only. So by default, you might not see your environment sphere, and most likely uh, it's because this is set to uh, zero right here, right? So if you just wanna enable it, now keep in mind, even though this is set to zero, you're still getting your color information from your environment. It's just basically not showing in your background. You can go ahead and enable it. Uh, I like to enable it, especially when I'm working. And then when I take the renders, I like to take it off. You can play with the exposure. So if you need more exposure, you can definitely play with that. Uh, I normally keep that at one. So that yeah, that's that. Environment rotation, shift and right click. You can change your environment on the fly or you can use a slider, but nine times out of 10, you'll just do shift and then scroll left and right with the right mouse button and you'll change that rotation on the environment sphere. Environment blur, you can go ahead and blur this out if you want it. We can come down here. We can play around the focal length, just like in Maya. If we have a smaller focal length, this is gonna look, uh, give you a lot of lens distortion. If you want something a lot more flat, you just make that a higher amount. I'm going to hit F on the keyboard so you see how orthographic that looks. So maybe if that's the look you're going for, you can. I'm just going to go ahead and reset that. So I'm just going to set that to 35 and just keep uh, working. Post effects, really don't play with these too much. If you want to get some cool post effects, you can put a vignette here. You can get lens distortion, glare if, if you wanted it. So just really depends on what your uh, final output or your render. I usually play with these more once I'm rendering an IRA and I'll cover IRA in a second. For now, this is pretty much uh, all you need to know about post effects. I'm just gonna turn those off. Here's subsurface scattering, anti-aliasing, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you could activate this here if you wanna put uh, subsurface scattering on. You could enable that, but you know, obviously for metals, I don't really see much of a point, but if you add skin, that could be useful. Here's just more uh, viewport settings. I really don't play with these that much. Most of the time, the only one that I'm really playing with is to show the wireframe. 
a lot of times, especially if I'm doing hard surface modeling or uh, I have a hard surface object and I want to get you know right in the middle of something, uh, sometimes it's hard to eyeball. But if you have the wireframe enabled, and we could definitely go in here and change the color, you know, if we wanted to have this right in the middle, we could actually use that wireframe to our advantage and drop that there. Um, you know, this is going to be a lot easier uh, if we show the wireframe versus trying to basically just eyeball it. All right, so moving on down from this right hand side, we have uh, the shader settings. I really don't play with this either. If you're using displacement maps, you, you'll definitely want that enabled. So if you want to push and pull in your actual geometry, you are looking to create uh, displacement maps or displacement information. You know, you probably want to come here. Also, uh, your tessellation, if you want to go ahead and enable that, this is where you would do it. This is your history. So the cool thing about Substance Painter is that it does actually remember all your history. In certain cases, just because it actually does this, you can go into Maya, change your UV layout, bring it in here, and it's actually gonna apply all this information. I've had had a break before, but uh, you know, I would say about 60, 70% of the time, I'm able to go into Maya, change the UV layout, re-import this, and all this history applied back into the new UV layout. That is one of the cool things about Substance that is pretty unique and that you can actually do uh, change your UV layouts and not lose your whole material or uh, map information. Lastly is the log. So just like in Maya, if you have issues, this is where it's going to be recorded. You could just diagnose issues. If you need to copy and paste them, you could do it. If you need to look for a solution, you could, you know, paste that into Google uh, along those lines. So let's start the fun part here and actually start texturing this model. So the first thing that I'll do is I'm going to go ahead and take this guy here and delete it. I'm actually going to go ahead and delete this as well. So we're going to be left with our bare model here. The first thing that we actually have to do is bake our textures, right? And I'll show you why this is important. So I'll go to Smart Material. I'll type in Paint. And I'm going to go hover over here, right? The Steel Painted. If you take a look at this thumbnail, we see that we have some nice edge wear, but the main or the bulk of this material or this thumbnail actually looks painted, right? And we have just that nice uh, edge wear effect. So I'm gonna go ahead and drag this here. It's gonna look nothing like the actual thumbnail, right? And if this ever happened to you, this is because all of the powerful effects that smart materials often have is actually driven by these maps, right? And if we don't have any maps, we're not gonna get those effects properly applied to our model. So. Here, if we go to our texture set settings, we have nothing. We haven't baked any maps. Usually, when I get into Substance Painter, this is the first thing that I actually do. What we're gonna do here is select Bake Mesh Maps, okay? And we have a couple options. If we actually just hover over here, it's gonna tell you what uh, these maps do. I'm gonna tell you right now, thickness, uh, this is a solid object, so we don't need to actually bake a thickness map, but things that are translucent, uh, maybe if you have skin that needs subsurface scattering, you'll definitely need that. But we have a hard surface object, so we definitely don't need to bake that map. And then normal, well, we're not bringing any normal information uh, to this model, right? So if we had a high resolution mesh that we wanted to bake out normal information, we would actually leave this checked on and we would bring in that high density mesh, right? The high res mesh to actually uh, bake a normal map, right? So really just the, the what it's gonna do, it's gonna look at the uh, high density information, right? The high, it's gonna compare it to the low and it's gonna you know look at the differences and it's gonna basically create a normal map for us. But we're actually gonna be creating a normal map a little bit later, but right now we actually don't need it. And the rest of these we're actually gonna use. This right here is gonna um, create our world space normals, uh, ID maps. Uh, ID maps are pretty powerful especially for masking sections off, especially if you have a lot of smaller objects. Sometimes it could be easier in a package like Maya to assign different materials to those objects or faces and just create an ID map versus actually doing the breakup within Substance Painter, right? So if we jump to Maya real quick, and look at this mesh here, right? This is what actually got exported into Substance Painter. Originally, this guy right here, if we hide this, 
This is actually what's gonna help us generate our ID map within Substance Painter. Now, this is a pretty simple uh, object, right? But if you have a more complicated scene, uh, maybe it's easier for you to actually just apply different materials to different objects, components, faces, right? And just export this into Substance Painter, have it generate an ID map for you versus setting everything up or breaking uh, all these up into different masks or different materials within Substance Painter. And you're gonna see this in a second, uh, how we actually do it. So here back in Substance to set the ID map, all we have to do is select ID, since the material color, right? That's what we want the uh, color source. And then under common here, we wanna go ahead and bring in this uh, ID, right? So it's actually the same model. It just has the different color IDs, right? The different material information. We'll hit open, and this is actually just gonna be used to create our ID map. For output size, under common, we'll set this 2K map. We could always up res this as well, so you could always change that. Uh, ambient occlusion, pretty self-explanatory. It's just gonna create a ambient occlusion map. Uh, I do like to put up the, the rays just up a little bit. You know, if you go crazy with this, it will increase your render times. But, you know, if you're getting any graininess in your ambient occlusion, you could definitely play with this and actually try to clean it up. So the curvature map is pretty important within Substance Painter. It's actually what drives a lot of the cool edge wear effects. I really just leave it alone uh, for the most part. Uh, don't really need to change anything. If I do or I need to clean this up, sometimes what I'll do is I'll play around with the details uh, if I'm not getting a correct bake. But uh, usually nine times out of 10, I just leave it as a default. And then right here, we also have the position maps. I'm gonna leave that checked on. And then uh, I'll go to bake metal uh, zero one mesh maps. If you have more than one texture set here, you actually do have the option of baking all of them at one time or you could bake them separately. But right now we don't have that option because we only have one texture set. I'll go ahead and hit bake. It's gonna take me through the process. If you have a newer version of Substance, you will see this cool interactive baking process uh, actually take effect. I'll hit okay. There we go, right? So now that we actually baked our maps, this actually looks exactly like the thumbnail. So now this is behaving properly, let's go ahead and go back to our layers and actually look at how this is being created, right? Especially with the smart materials. And this is actually how I learned Substance Painter. Once I had my maps baked, I would just throw different uh, smart materials on there and kind of just reverse engineer how they were built. And I got a feel on, you know, a lot of different components. And then once I uh, kind of broke it down, I was able to create my own smart materials. Let's look at the uh, paint here first. If we just hide this, we see that this is just a paint layer, right? And then it has a mask like we talked about, right? And then it looks like we have two separate fills here with different effects. Let's just go ahead and hide the effects. And now we see that we just have a flat uh, paint layer, right, a, a flat fill. So if we were to go in here and we actually click the mask, we see two things that are driving the mask, right? So we have a warp. So all the warp is doing is just adding more distortion to that actual mask. So it's actually just giving it a, a nice breakup. And then we have the mask editor, right? So the mask editor, is actually what is controlling this mask here and really just basing it off the edge wear here, right? So if we go in here, we'll take a look and even though we see that there's a bunch of maps plugged in here, if we go in here and actually start Xing these out, there's nothing changing. And that's because this mask editor for this effect is actually just using the curvature, right? So if we actually X out the curvature, you see that we lose all our information, right? So really uh, the mask editor in this instance is actually just being driven by the curvature itself. And this curvature here, we could actually uh, affect the influence of that curvature, right? So one, uh, that uh, curv curvature map is gonna be fully affecting it, and then zero, it's not gonna affect it at all. I'm gonna leave that at one, and you can go ahead and play with this, but this is pretty much the breakdown of the mask editor. And then, you know, this filter here is just adding that warp effect, right? So let's go ahead and unhide that. And then we have here, if we select 
the uh, we go back in here and we're going to enable that and we look at these different fills so these different fills they're just adding more information here right so this first fill here is adding dirt so what we could do and it's actually just adding it to the height right remember how we said we could actually affect different parameters in here we can go in here and change it and instead of using this dirt maybe if we want to look more like concrete we can go in here set this to concrete and just take the height of that concrete and now this is going to look more like concrete than dirt right so you could just basically add different fill layers and then set different materials and then once you add a material you could actually take which part of that material you want to actually affect or take into effect this fill it just has kind of the spots using this spots right here so we'll, we can hide this here we see that we have a metal just a base steel this fill right here is adding uh, some noise here right so it's just a base uh, steel just a regular material and then they just added a fill layer here they came in here and it looks like they're applying just the uh, color information only so this metal details here just has a blur so we'll take the blur off it looks like they added another fill layer uh, don't be fooled or maybe mistaken right so if you see dirt three here this is just being renamed right uh, this is actually just a fill layer so if we go in here you see properties fill so this is pretty much the root node that they used same thing here it's a fill layer and they just went in here and grabbed a, a dirt material right so they typed in dirt so let's go ahead and turn all these back on and just take a look at this if i want a little bit too quick this was just me basically applying a smart material and going through each of the settings right the meat and potatoes uh, of how though that effect actually got created we're actually going to go ahead and create our own and recreate this and just add our own flair to this right so i'll go in here and i'll hit delete and then uh, instead of a smart material we'll go here to our regular materials I'll look for a steel so we'll put a steel rough here and I'm just looking at this orbiting and maybe I want to go with a metal so let's go with this iron uh, raw damage so I'm going to select it I'm going to drag it on here and this looks pretty good um, I'm going to go ahead and delete this so I just selected it. You can hit delete on your keyboard. You could also select it, hit the little trash bin there. We have our iron damaged. We're gonna go ahead and create a fill layer, right? For this, I want kind of this industrial uh, yellow uh, type of uh, color. So I'll go in here. I'm just gonna go ahead and play with these swatches till I get the color that I want. So something a little bit more orangey. There we go. So that's the base color that I want and then from here I'm gonna right click I'm gonna go ahead and add a white mask right so nothing's gonna exciting is gonna happen because you know obviously this is just a solid white mask so everything is just basically being kept how it is all right so now we have a white mask here what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click I'm gonna go to add generator right now nothing happened because we don't have a generator selected right so it's going to tell you hey you have a generator but it's empty so we'll click generator here i'm going to go to metal edgeware so i'm going to build this a little bit different but we're going to get the same result at the end of the day this is just going to be another generator plugging into mainly the curvature map and it's going to basically carve out that nice edgeware for our texture right so we'll select metal edgeware looks like everything is flipped right so the yellow is actually supposed to be metal and the metal is supposed to be yellow so what we can do is right click here so we can select our mask here right click and then hit invert and this is going to add a filter so if we go to invert mask you see it inverted it and it just actually add a levels right here a levels filter and there we go right so the cool thing about this is that now we have our yellow paint we have the uh, generator that is mainly tied into this curvature map so if we uh, go and 
take out the ambient occlusion, you won't see much change. You'll see a little bit of change, but the bulk of the work is being driven by this curvature map. You see that if we exit out of that, most of the effect goes away. This metal edge where it does have more options. Most of these generators have a lot of options that you could basically play with. So if we wanted more wear, we could go ahead and scrub from left to right. And that's gonna just basically apply more or less wear. We can play with the contrast. So obviously more contrast is gonna give it more contrast. Tri blender blending, really don't play with this much. It's not really changing much, so really don't use it that much. The grunge amount, so this does have a built-in grunge slider that you could add or reduce grunge. Grunge scale, how big you want that. I do play with this quite often, so sometimes I do want the grunge or the effect to be kind of large uh, instead of like, if you go really, really small, this is gonna look very, very repeated. You know, a lot of times I just kind of go for a larger uh, grunge scale but that's how you can control the level of grunge basically being chipped away at that paint. Here we can control the uh, edge smoothness. I'm just gonna set that to one. And here is uh, the curvature weight. So obviously uh, the more closer to one, the more weight that curvature map is actually you know inflicting. So now we have this nice little uh, chipped paint effect that is mainly affecting our uh, borders, right? Or our edges here, courtesy of that curvature map. And then, you know, through that metal edge wear, it did give us uh, some added controls to just add, kind of sprinkle some grunge. The cool thing about these masks is that, you know, if we wanted to art direct this a little bit better, right? We could actually do this ourselves as well. What we would have to do is we could go in here and we could add a paint layer, right? So maybe we can't fully get the effects that we want solely by these uh, sliders, right? And this is where a lot of the textures or a lot of the materials of Substance Painter really uh, can be pushed to the next level with using brushes and paint layers, especially starting out, you might be tempted just to slap on kind of this smart material and leave it as be, but sometimes these materials can become very popular and it's very easy just to spot them, right? So you don't really wanna have the same material that every other artist is using. So you could definitely use paint layers to really push those masks and push those unique details and look and really just have something that really uh, makes your work pop or stand out from the crowd, right? So here we have this paint layer and obviously we can go in here. This is affecting this here. You see that we can go ahead and paint away uh, s some of these if we wanted to. Obviously you probably wouldn't wanna be uh, using this alpha here. So let me redo that paint layer and actually get a normal alpha for this. So I'm actually gonna go to brushes here and I'm gonna get this dirt, right? And you see that um, this alpha here, now we have this alpha dirt brush and I'm gonna go ahead and scale this up. So now I can, obviously we're, we're using white. So we wanna basically introduce black to our mask, meaning we're gonna chip away at the paint. So we can set this to black and there we go, right? So I'm just gonna go ahead and play with this brush. And now you see that I'm actually art directing and I'm not just following or limited to whatever those sliders are just giving me, right? So I could go in here, you know, and if I wanna just to kind of break this up a little bit more in certain areas, I can go in here. Or sometimes what could happen is this edge where it can become a little bit too uh, uniform. So you could actually hit X and just like in Photoshop, that's gonna flip between black and white. You see that right here, we have black, we have white by hitting X and we can go ahead and basically, you know, start taking away some edge wear, right? And, and not make it as uniformly. And that's one of the things about the edge wear that it, it can seem kind of very uniform. So if you wanna break that up, you could definitely do that uh, with the help of, you know, these brushes. One of the things you might notice uh, right off the back, especially if you're working with this model, is we have some very apparent seam lines. So what I'm gonna do is, actually had that hide the paint layer here. Underneath the metal, you see that there's a pretty obvious seam. So what we can do to alleviate uh, this seam right here is we could actually change the way that uh, the material, right, is actually being projected. So here, we're gonna select the layer, and you see that we're using the UV projection. So if we go here and change this to triplanar, you see that uh, it's changing the uh, projection here and we actually get rid of some of these uh, lines right here, right, the seam line that we had. So 
That might actually help if you are getting uh, seam lines in your model. Uh, sometimes with the bakes, um, that might happen. So, you know, switching things to tri planer might actually help. So we'll go ahead and turn the paint layer back on. The next thing that we want to do is, even though this is a uniform model, we actually want to go ahead and change the color of these doors right here to a darker metal. And we do have a couple options. I'll show you both. The first one is going to this uh, little thing right here. And in order to actually activate it, we need to be on a mask for this to be uh, available, right? So what I'm gonna do is actually group both of these layers. And that way, since they're working as unison, uh, we need to go ahead and group them and then we can apply an additional mask to that group itself, right? So we'll select both layers. We can go ahead and uh, right click and we could do group layers. Alternatively, we can hit Control G on our keyboard. And there we go, right? So we'll name this yellow paint, hit enter. And now we'll go ahead and hide this. And we're gonna go ahead and look for a darker uh, material or a darker metal to actually build out the doors, right? So what I'll do here is I'll go back to my materials, type in metal, and we want something a little bit darker here. So I think this might work. So I'm gonna select this and drag it to our model. All right, so that looks good. Now we can go ahead and select this guy here, just like in Photoshop, the order actually is important, right? So we're gonna go ahead and drag this over here and then we'll select the eyeballs. And now we need to go ahead and apply a mask to uh, cut out the actual doors here to reveal the darker material. So I'm gonna go ahead and right click and we'll do it at a white mask. Once this mask is selected, you see that this option now becomes available. So we'll go ahead and select Polygon Fill. Now we have these properties available to us, right? And we have a couple of options, depending on how your uh, mesh is actually constructed, this will work or might not work. Let's go over some of the options here. So whatever I set this to, right? Since we wanna go ahead and take away from this mask, we wanna set this to black. So the first one is the Triangle Fill. Now. Even though this uh, might uh, seem odd since this looks like it's all quadded, uh, what Substance will actually do is triangulate your mesh. So there actually are tries right here, right? So if we click here, you see that these quads are actually triangulated so we can select the uh, tries or we can go ahead and just select the quads here. It, may, it might make more sense if you are just viewing the viewport here with, with the uh, wireframe, right? So as you see, as we click on these uh, components here, we're basically applying a black mask per those components. We could actually move it up to a mesh fill. So depending on how your mesh is built, luckily for us, this is a separate pieces. So the mesh fill will actually work. You can go ahead and do that like this. Uh, the other option that I can show you is we'll go back here to our uh, 3D and 2D view. And we can go to the next one here, which is your uh, UV uh, chunk fill, right? So if your object that you wanna go ahead and uh, apply that black mask to is uh, basically its own UV island, you can just select this option and you see that it'll actually work this way as well, right? So we can click the UV island and uh, or the UV chunk and it'll actually start being filled. The other option that we have is actually using that ID map that we generated earlier, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna set this to white and I'll go ahead and undo this one and I'll show you how to basically apply the same uh, method but using that ID map that we created. So I'll go ahead and go back here, I'll right click, and then I'll do add mask with color selection. And as soon as I do that, you see that this ID mask actually comes into play, right? So from the actual paint, so all I did is from the mask, I right clicked and I did add mask with color selection. And now we can do the same exact thing, right? So I'll go in here 
and then I will do pick color. In this case, we want to go ahead, uh, basically pick this color out. So that was another way of doing the same exact thing. So looking at this darker steel, I want to push the material a little bit more and add some dirt and grime, especially areas that are going to make contact. Uh, these crevices here where naturally uh, dirt and grime would accumulate over time. I'm going to go ahead and just apply some dirt. So the way we're going to do that is we'll go here. We will add a fill layer. So from this fill layer, what I want to do is apply a mask. So I'll right click. I'll go to add a white mask. So that's set up here. I'll click on my base color and type in dirt one. And you will see this dirt material. And obviously right now it's all over the place because we haven't uh, set up the mask properly. So we'll go here, click our mask, right click, add a generator. This time under generator, we will pick the dirt generator. So this generator is using the curvature, also is using the AO, and the AO makes a lot of sense because the AO is usually strongest where you have these contact shadows, and that's usually where uh, this dirt and grime will build up, right, in these crevices. So if we go here and we take a look and we play around with the dirt levels, we can start to basically edit that amount of dirt and grime accumulated. So play around with this, play around with the contrast a little bit. And right now, some of this is hard to see because we have this, uh, you know, silver material and this is black and white. So let's go ahead and introduce some color to our dirt. So I'm gonna right click the layer here, add a filter, and this filter is gonna be a gradient. You can type it in here if you want, but I'm just gonna select it here and there it is, right? So from this gradient, I'm gonna go ahead and pick a couple colors. So I'll go in here and just start pretty much setting up a brown, a lighter brown color. We could also increase the grunge amount as well. So I finished tweaking these uh, to my liking and I think I'm pretty happy with this. If you wanted this just to affect the uh, steel right here, we could just add a mask to this. I actually like just kind of this overall dirt uh, all over my model, but you do have the option with masks of, you know, having different dirt layers and, you know, basically further tweaking that for each section. So this looks pretty good so far. You know, we could call this done, but I think this could actually be pushed a little bit more with some height information, right? And this is the cool thing about uh, Substance Painter is that with alphas, we could actually stamp added details and then we can bake out a normal map and have all the maps update to that new height information, which will then update all the details that we built with these layers back onto the new added detail. So for this, you have a couple options. You could use the defaults. You can create your own uh, alphas. I'm actually gonna go ahead and use a alpha pack this is the alpha pack that I'll be using from J Road Tools. He has a lot of these uh, stamped collections, but I'm gonna go down here. This is the pack that I'll be using. And this pack is pretty much for a hard surface. So it does kind of fit the theme pretty well, but he has a variety of other ones. I will go ahead and link this in the description down below, as well as the YouTube card. So I'll go ahead and show you the alphas. And they're already here in my alphas collection. So the way he named it, it's pretty smart. It's just j -Row. And j -Row will actually just filter all the ones that have j -Row on in the front, which are pretty much all the uh, hard surface uh, stamps here. So they are right here. And if you need to install these, what I recommend is go to your uh, Substance Painter directory. If you're on the Windows side, I'll go ahead and put the director here and you can just go ahead, whatever uh, alphas you do download, you could just drag them into that directory and they should be available uh, once you start Substance Painter. So first thing that I'll do is I'll go ahead and hide all my uh, color information, all my materials, and I'll get a regular layer and I'll rename this to height 
underscore panels. And I want to just name these properly and organize this properly because we're going to have a couple of these, right? So from this point, I'm going to get a, a fill layer underneath and just drop it in. So I'll scroll down here and I'll hide color. And basically I'm going to hide everything but height. And now we should be able to get a stamp, right? Or one of these alphas to stamp with. So I'm going to go ahead and look for a cool stamp. So I think I'm going to go with this container O2. I'll double click. Now we see that we can basically stamp with this alpha, right? So I want to make sure that I'm going down on this. I want this to be actually pushing down on our mesh. And you see that we're starting to get a, a nice little result here, right? So what I need to do is first do a couple of things. If I want to work symmetrically, we can enable symmetry. And symmetry is right here. So we can enable this. We can change our symmetry settings. But I think I want to go ahead and work with the X. See, now we, we have symmetry working. So from this point, I'm going to go ahead and just with uh, control and right clicking and doing a scrubbing left to right. I'm increasing the size of this. And maybe we can put um, just stamp a little bit of detail right there. And I'm actually just going to change this. So let's go ahead and try a different uh, panel line. So let's check out this container four. Yeah, I like this a lot better. And so I'm going to select this here. What I'll do in this case is I want to right in the middle. I can go to my display settings here. I'm going to show the wireframe and bring this color down. So now with the wireframe, it's going to be easier for me to get right in the middle of this and just line it up pretty straight. And sometimes it might take a couple of times just to kind of line it up. So you definitely have to be patient, but you can see that having the uh, mesh underneath uh, that the wireframes definitely helps. So I like that a lot. So let's go ahead and I'm not gonna get too carried away with these stamps. I just wanna show you how they work. And it is actually easy to get carried away with these. So uh, from here, Let's go ahead and look for another one. So I'm gonna select this container here, or this handle. I'm gonna dial this down just a little bit. I don't want it that strong. I'm gonna go ahead and plop this guy right about here. I like how that looks. So a lot of this is gonna be just pretty much me exploring. So what I'll do in this case is um, I'll go ahead and fast forward this, but I'm basically just selecting these guys and clicking them on there and pretty much pushing down on my surface. All right, next we're gonna go ahead and use radial symmetry to draw some bolts around uh, these uh, parts right here. So what I'll do is actually create a new layer. I'll rename this to height underscore bolts. And the reason I'm doing this is obviously we could have everything in one layer, but let's just say that if we wanted to uh, erase some of this, some of these details here on this panels layer, what we could do is either we could apply a mask or we could go with the eraser and just erase some of that height information, right? And right now we, we have radial symmetry on. That's why, you know, this is a little bit uh, wonky, but uh, you get the point, right? So at any point you can either erase, delete these layers, uh, but just for organizational purposes, I do recommend that you break these down logically, all right? So here, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, get radial symmetry working. So we'll go here to the radial symmetry options. And we want to figure out how many uh, counts and in what axes we need to work with. Well, looks like we're an X and X is the actual symmetry that or the actual axes that we need. So we're going to leave that alone. So we'll go back here to the settings and maybe we want, let's see how 12 looks here. Maybe increase it just a little bit more. So let's up this to about 12 or I'm sorry, 16. I'm going to get a nice uh, bolt pattern here. So I'm going to double click here. Let's go to brush 
and see what we get. So there's something going on here. Let's go ahead and troubleshoot this so it wraps all the way around. And it's giving us here a preview. So we need to play with the angle span. And we didn't have this to 360, so it won't actually revolve uh, 360, right? So I'm going to go ahead and put this one right here. Maybe I'll make this a little bit smaller. Yeah, and I like how that looks. Looks pretty clean. We'll go ahead and do the same thing on the other side. And you can see that, that having that wireframe there really just helps us uh, get pretty uh, precise in the uh, placement. Let's see how this would look with another row right here. Yeah, it doesn't look bad at all. So I'm going to go ahead and repeat that on this other side. And a lot of this stuff is just trial and error. So I'm just experimenting with uh, different uh, patterns. The last thing that I want to do is I want to create uh, just the panel line. I'm not sure how that got there. Probably when I was doing radial symmetry, but not a big deal. It's in this layer right here. So I'll go ahead and with my eraser tool, just erase it. I'll go ahead and kill uh, radial symmetry and actually just disable it all together. Make sure I'm on the right layer and I'm going to erase that information there. And then I'll create one more layer. I'll name this height panel lines. For this, I just need a regular uh, alpha. So I think this looks pretty good. When you're trying to create a panel line, obviously you can uh, freeform it, but you probably don't want that. Uh, Substance does have a couple of options that make this a little bit easier. So I'm gonna hold down control, scrub left to right, holding the uh, right mouse button, just to basically get my height just pretty much almost to match this thickness here. And then I'm gonna click here, and then we can hold down shift, and then control is gonna actually snap, looks like 15 degree increments. So sometimes this is easier to do on the uh, UV uh, layout itself uh, versus the 3D mode. So what I'll do is I'm just gonna undo that and I'm gonna try that here on the uh, map itself or just the uh, texture map itself. So I'm gonna click, hold down shift, and you see that it's a lot easier doing it here uh, especially if we have this wireframe. So I'm gonna match that up and there we go. So we get a nice clean panel line. And obviously we're gonna have to erase a little bit here or we could just be a little bit more careful with the with the stroke that we're doing. All right, so this, that looks pretty good. Just trying to match it up so the, the corners uh, are not that bad. You can't always just go in and if you wanted to clean it up, Let's see if we can erase here a little bit. We could clean that up if you need it. But I think that looks pretty good, especially when we rebake these maps. Uh, this is going to have AO, so a lot of this is going to just fill in and blend in a lot better than it is now. So I'll go back to your brush. Uh, one thing I do recommend on your brush setting is remember the size of your brush. So this is 1.27. And that's because a lot of times I'll change the brush size on the fly with the uh, shortcut and I'll forget what this is. So you can create a custom brush. I'm not gonna get into all that, but just it's a good thing to remember uh, your brush size. It's also right here on the size as well. All right, so that panel line looks pretty good. I'm trying to see where else we could drop another panel line. I think I'm just gonna extend it here. What we can do is enable uh, symmetry again. So that looks good. So that should uh, basically take care of the other side for us. So I'll go in here, same thing, click, hold on shift. So that looks pretty good. And there, the other side is updated as well. I need to erase that. I'm not gonna worry about it right now. I'm just gonna go ahead and draw the panel line, cut right through it, and then we can go ahead and take care of this, erasing this in a second. So I'll find this guy here. Same thing as before. I'll click here, and this should be about the middle. And there we go. 
There's our other panel line. It's this layer here. So we'll click the eraser tool. I'm just gonna drag this up, clean that up. And it just, with radial symmetry, looks like I drew a bunch of these, which there shouldn't be. So I'm gonna clean these up really quick. And that's kind of the good thing about having things in separate layers. Uh, just helps you helps you troubleshoot uh, if you ever have issues like this. All right, so I went through and just kind of cleaned that up a little bit. And I think I'm going to do some additional bolts around this uh, panel line here. I think this is going to just tie in both of these pieces. So I'll go back to my bolts here. I'll find that same bolt pattern. It, it looks like it was this one here. Make sure that's on the actual uh, brush and not the eraser. I'll find this layer here. Bring up my brush. All right, so I think that looks pretty good. Maybe we can drop something else maybe here. Just another little piece. And a lot of times, this is a lot of just trial and error, going through and you know finding the one piece that's gonna complement this. So uh, it doesn't come naturally or quick just doing these designs, even though the process is somewhat uh, fun and easy. Just finding a good design and finding that balance can take a little bit of time. All right, so this actually looks pretty good. I'm happy with all the details. So let's go ahead and hide our fill layer and enable our other layers on here. So we'll see that this starts to blend a little bit better, but if we actually zoom in, we only have height information and all the work that we did on these right here, right? The edge wear, the grime, it's not being applied to this, right? Because we actually have to do a additional step in order to get this to recalculate all these maps. So what we're gonna do is bake out a normal map and then from that normal map, we're gonna rebake all these other maps, all right? So the first thing that we need to do is we'll go to File, we'll go to Export Textures. This can seem a little bit intimidating here, but basically we have predetermined configurations for Substance Painter, right? So. If you're going to a package like Maya, so we have a Arnold preset. If you're using a key shot, there it is. So uh, depending on where your uh, final uh, rendering journey ends, uh, you definitely have a lot of uh, different presets for uh, use within Substance Painter. If you need to get more advanced, you can build out your own within this configuration tab. I'm not gonna dive into it right now. This is a little bit more advanced and you can really just do a lot with the uh, presets that you have, all right? So from here, what I'm gonna do is I wanna export the normal map. So I already have a preset. This will just export your normal map. You won't have that preset. So the, what you can do is you could do document channels, normal AO, right? So that has a normal already built in. So we'll select that. It's gonna spit out, this is gonna be your directory. Let's go ahead and bring this up. So for my final, I want everything to be nice and high res. So I'm gonna do 4K, a 4K map. That's gonna be the final bakes. I will do a TIFF. We can set this to 16 bits. This should be ready to go. I'll hit export. I'll go to open folder. So this is the map that is spit out, this uh, Metal Zero One Normal Direct X from here, we just basically have to re-import it into our scene. So from within your export folder, all you're gonna do is just take that file and just drag it into the shelf. And then we have to define a couple parameters. So instead of undefined, I'll go to texture, import resources to, we'll do this as a uh, project. A uh, current session is once you exit out of this, it will be lost. Uh, project is anytime that you open up this file, it will be there if it's associated with this project. And then the shelf is gonna always be there when you open up Substance. We wanna do project. 
and hit import. There it is under textures, there's our map. So now we can go to our texture set settings. There's no normal map here, which is perfect. We're gonna click, drag, and drop that there. One thing we should do is A, get rid of, uh, or at least hide all this um, height information. So I'll go ahead and select all of them. You can select uh, multiple uh, layers by holding, clicking one, holding down shift, clicking the bottom. We have a group selection. I'll hit control G, that's gonna group it. I'll double click to rename. So we'll do height underscore stamps and we'll hide that because now we have a normal map that's driving this information, all right? So from here, we'll go to texture set settings. We will go to bake mesh maps. Now the key to getting this to work is that we don't really need to select normal map, right? We want to derive all these maps or bake them derived from this new normal map. So we'll leave normal unchecked. I'm gonna go ahead and put this up to 4K. What I'll do from here is I'll go to bake metal zero one mesh maps. And I'll speed up the video. I'll hit okay. And one thing uh, I should do is hide the wireframe. So we'll get rid of the wireframe by going here to our display settings. We will uncheck this right here. So I'm looking at this, all the maps updated, the material updated to fit the new height information, but I wanna go ahead and break this up just a little bit more. So I'm gonna show you how you can do this and actually copy and paste masks as well, right? So I'm gonna drag a steel painted here just to show you the example. So we have this steel painted material. Let's go ahead and hide the dirt. We'll also hide the uh, yellow paint. You see that we have this steel painted underneath, right? So we wanna go ahead and isolate this ring right here. So the first thing that we need to do is have this on top, but cut through and actually show this different color uh, bay doors, right? So we're gonna go ahead and right click. We're gonna add a white mask. We can go ahead and take off symmetry here. And then from here, we wanna add a, using the polygon fill option, we'll go to uh, mesh fill here, set this to black. And now you see that we're cutting in here, we're cutting in here, cutting in here, and cutting in here. All right, the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna go here to our paint and do a similar process. So from this point, we wanna tweak this mask, right? So we already have this set to a, a polygon or a mesh fill. That's not gonna work because this is the same mesh, right? So what we need to do in this case is do a UV uh, fill, right? Because if we look at our UVs, these guys are separate UV groups, right? So when we're clicking, you see that these guys are actually being isolated. So the mesh won't work, but the UV chunk will actually do it, right? So we'll click here and start selecting these UV chunks. And that's why it's important if you know that you're gonna be going to Substance Painter, sometimes you can lay out your UVs in a way that's actually gonna help you quite a bit uh, when bringing them in and doing masking and selections, right? So that looks pretty good. But the problem is we probably don't want this bright red, right? So we, we no longer need our UVs. I'm gonna go ahead and hide this. Go back to a 3D only. So we have the right mask, the wrong material. Luckily, we could copy a mask, paste it onto the right material, right? So let's go ahead and bring the uh, one that we want, the material that we want. I'm gonna go with this steel rough damaged. I'll go ahead and bring this in like this. And this looks pretty good. So what we'll do in this case is we wanna go ahead and use this mask here and apply it here. We'll go ahead and add a white mask. We'll go here, have the mask selected, right click. We'll go to copy mask. We'll hide this guy here. We'll select this mask, right click, 
and then I'll go paste into mask. And now you see that this mask got pasted and all the work looks good. We didn't have to start over. We're basically able to copy and paste that mask. We can take this guy here, delete it. We can go back to our brush. And I think that looks pretty good. Let's enable our dirt. And before um, I render this, I do wanna show you the uh, filters. So you could actually filter through each channel. So if you hit C on your keyboard, you'll get each separate uh, channel by itself. You can paint this way or you could troubleshoot. You could actually filter this way uh, with this drop down menu. To get back to your uh, material, you just hit M and there you go. So now I'll go ahead and go into iRay and hit this little camera icon. What we'll wanna do is hide the background, at least I like to do it, I think this is a little bit too busy. So I'll go here to the settings and we'll select clear color. We'll go ahead and just give it a little bit of a tint. So I think that looks pretty good. Uh, if we don't want that contact shadow, we could get rid of the ground and that's right here. We'll just uncheck ground, we got rid of that. And now we just wanna rotate the sphere and figure out just the right angle. But I think I'm gonna change this and you can play around with this uh, however you want. I'm gonna go to this bus garage and you'll definitely wanna uh, pick an environment sphere that complements uh, your model. And I'll go ahead and rotate and just find somewhere where the highlights and the shadows look right. And I'm holding down shift and right clicking, just like it when I do when I'm in uh, normal mode, when I'm painting my textures to orbit uh, this environment or to rotate it. So I finally got the angle that I wanted. So I'm gonna let Substance actually uh, render this a little bit longer. So I'll go to render settings here and I'm gonna play with the samples. All right, so what I wanna do is instead of 10 seconds, I'm gonna let this render out for 60. So you see that I put up the time and this is doing more iterations and the more iterations, the clearer this will be. So I'll let it render, I'll pause this and then I'll see you uh, when this is done. You can also play with the uh, samples here and crank these up, but this looks pretty good. I'm happy with it. This is the final render. So the last order of business is to actually export this out. If you need to override your uh, doc, your viewport resolution, then you can do it here. And I'm actually just gonna do 1920 by 1080, so it looks nice on a video. So there we go. Uh, you have the option of sharing this to ArtStation as well. I'll hit save render to save locally. And that is the end of my Substance Painter for Beginners complete tutorial. So thank you so much for watching this Substance Painter beginners tutorial and hopefully uh, Substance Painter and the information that you watch today will improve the overall quality of your 3D assets and your overall portfolio. As always, please let me know what you thought of the video in the comments down below. Like the video and please consider subscribing to the channel as I plan on doing a lot more Substance Painter tutorials like this more often. Thank you so much, folks, and I will catch you next time.